Holy God, we come into your presence as your people. We come into your presence as people who are saved by your hand. We come into your presence to worship and to give glory and to offer all that we are to you. And we thank you for everything that you have done for us. And may everything that we offer you this morning be acceptable to you. And in return, Lord, we pray that you continue to flow your Holy Spirit through us and on us so that we might leave this place as new people. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen, our ascended, our glorified Lord, and all of God's people said, Amen. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to this uh, Memorial Day weekend Sunday. Many of us are on the road and many of you have made your way here via the road. So welcome here if you are a guest. Uh, right after church, on, uh, I don't know if the sermon will be any shorter, but right after church, our family is zipping up to Minnesota. I'm not even going to be at the door to greet. Bob Friesen said he would do that. So uh, here's your chance to talk to Bob. and. Uh, come through this door when I'm not here. Um, but you are welcome here. Whatever brings you here, wherever you are going, uh, may the Spirit of God be in this place, and may you be touched by the presence of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ this morning. Why don't you stand and invite someone here in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's remain standing. And speaking of the ascension, the resurrection, the ascension, and the glory of Jesus Christ as seen in the Holy Spirit as we celebrated Pentecost last week, let's sing the song, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
Actually, if you would turn to uh, hymnal worship book 856, where it's divided, we can read it off of there. Italics together, I the regular print, you the bold. Together. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, it's all of you, clothe our, yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Together, above all, Clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. This is the, the passage of sort of the fruits of the Spirit from Colossians. In, in Corinthians, Paul talks about the fruits of the Spirit as well as in Galatians. And uh, those fruits are given to us by the Holy Spirit. We celebrated the Holy Spirit last week in Pentecost, the giving of it to the church, the empowering of us, how it helps us regenerate. We can't do really anything without the advocate, the comforter, the Holy Spirit. And so this next song that we're going to sing actually comes out of the Church of the Brethren tradition. And I was talking to Wes, and maybe some of you that know Church of the Brethren, this is a familiar, very familiar song that comes out of that tradition. And it was the Church of the Brethren addition to our hymnal, because we have the hymnal together with them. Uh, as they added this song. This song, if you think about it, is the calling of this Holy Spirit to empower us, to give us those gifts, the patience, the love, the compassion, the humility, the meekness that is needed to clothe ourselves in Jesus Christ. Move in our midst, O Spirit of God.
As God's gifts are brought to the altar, why don't you stand and let's give thanks for what is being brought to God's kingdom. Praise God. Katie, bring your offering of music to us. Katie and Sarah. If you would uh, join me in Scripture, Acts chapter 28. And you have no doubt noticed that we are, since the resurrection, working our way through Acts. Not necessarily in a linear way, but... Uh, Last week, of course, was Pentecost. This week, we go to the absolute end of the book of Acts. And Paul has been, has taken a, 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 he's been arrested in Jerusalem, and he's sent from Jerusalem to Rome, 
and it's the trip where he has a shipwreck and he gets shipwrecked on uh, Malta and, uh, and uh, gets bit by a snake and all bunch of stuff happens and then he gets to Rome and he put, gets put on house arrest and he has discussions with the, the Jewish leaders and the Christian leaders there at the time uh, and uh, that's where we find this passage, the context in which we find it. And he's quoting the prophet Isaiah. Go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will, never, you will be never seeing, you will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. Or some of your defini- uh, translations will be dull. They hardly hear with their ears. And they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes. They might hear with their ears. They might understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. That's where I'm going to go on just a little bit here. Therefore, Paul goes on to say then, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles. He opened it up to everybody. That's us. And they will listen, hopefully. And then for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and talked about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how the book of Acts ends. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for another text with which we can wrestle. We thank you for our ears and our eyes. And may it be that, in fact, we will hear and perceive that we will see and understand that my mouth will speak what needs to be spoken. Open all our mouths, ears, hearts, souls, and my mouth to speak. In Christ's name, amen. Repent! Ha! I woke you guys up. First word. I don't know about you, but when I hear the word repent, I often hear it with a fire and brimstone preacher up front pounding the pulpit, stalking up and down and yelling and screaming and generally scaring the love of God into you. And to be absolutely honest, this image doesn't really attract me to the love and the grace of God. And it probably doesn't represent necessarily always the better side of Christianity. However, just because some Christians have abused the word repent doesn't mean we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. The definition and the practice of repentance, of repent, needs to be wrestled away from the abusers of the concept and be brought back into the line of what God is actually calling us to do. And if you read through the book of Acts, you find out that repent is a pretty central (coughs) word, concept. In fact, after the people had seen, after the people had accused the apostles when they were speaking in tongues after the Pentecost uh, and accused them of being drunk, Peter stood up and said, no, it isn't even nine o'clock. We're not drinking. It is the Holy Spirit. And he gave them a sermon. And then they asked, what must we do to be saved? And he says, repent, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Repent. Repent. It's a word that needs to be wrestled away from the hardcore sort of fear, but at the same time, a word that we shouldn't take lightly as a church. It's a word that calls for serious action in all of our hearts and souls, and even in our actions that we do as a church together. But it's not an action fundamentally done out of fear and arm twisting. My trusty dictionary defines repent as to feel such regret of one's ways that one makes a change for the better. Now that dictionary is 30 years old already. I got it when I graduated from high school. I'm not quite 30 yet, but close. To feel such regret, and I think the the definition hasn't changed any, 
The f to feel such regret of one's ways that one makes a change for the better. In other words, repent is to know and understand that the old way is not the right way. And so you change your life to the new way so that it becomes the good way, the better way. In essence, it is to do what is illegal to do in Bueller. Make a U-turn on Main Street. <laughs> you are called to make a U-turn in life once you are convicted of the fact that the direction you are going is the wrong way. Except if you're driving down Main Street and you need to go to the grocery store and you're heading down the south way. And you don't want to cross the street walking. Make a U-turn. Now, when I did things at home wrong, which wasn't all that long, I was hoping my brother would be here too, but he's already up in Minnesota. Um, my dad would often say to me, probably most often to him, but not, you know. Uh, <laughs> But because we spoke Plotich at home, he would say to us, when we had done something, he would just look at us and he'd say, Du Weizbeta. You know better. Du Weizbeta. And I think that this was his succinct way, but profound way, of showing me that my actions were wrong and needed to change. That, in fact, I w was self-convicted, if I really thought about it, to take that U-turn. And I usually did know better. I did. Can't always tell you why I did the things I did or why David did the things he did. He's not here to defend himself. But we would change to doing what is right. And if I took his admonition, I would turn. I would make a U-turn and repent. I would change my behavior to what I knew was right. Now the Apostle Paul in today's scripture, in Acts 20, uh, 28, is calling people to turn and to do what is right. He is saying, ye vita beta, you know better. In fact, it's a tough scripture to deal with because Paul is being quite blunt. Now, if you notice the context, he's already talked with all the church leaders and the synagogue leaders for quite some time. And what he says here at the end, and in fact, he's appealing to them. One of the reasons he's talking to them, he's appealing to them because he was sent by the Jewish people in Jerusalem to Rome to be executed on a death sentence. And he wants to appeal to, he has to appeal to the emperor of Rome. And he's appealing to the Jewish leaders in Rome because maybe they, if they talk things through, they'll change their mind. And they won't agree with and they'll, they'll step in on his behalf. And so they talk. And they have a few weeks of talking, a few years of talking. And the only thing that's recorded of that is this very blunt pointing out of the religious situation. Now you can say that's just the Jews, or you can say that's whatever. But it's the blunt pointing out of the situation of what happens in the uh, establishment, especially religious establishment. He is telling, Paul is telling the established religious leaders and the people that they have not been receptive to the love and the truth of God. In fact, Paul quotes the prophet Isaiah, who is telling their ancestors from many years before, before they are sent into uh, exile, he is telling them that they are totally missing the point. Now this is where it gets a little tough because Paul, his mission is to appeal to these guys so they'll step in and help him out in, in the face of the emperor. And then he brings down this hammer. So Paul is being quite bold here. He's, he's telling the truth in the face of his own well-being. He's saying that, in fact, God is at work in the world and is calling them to join him at work, but they are missing that work because of all their religion. <laughs> Verse 27, Paul brings the hammer down and he accuses them of the following. You have lost your passion for being the people of God. You just do the things because you've always done them, whatever. There is no passion that drives you. 
Secondly, he says, you are becoming deaf to my good news and my calling. You can hear, but you don't really understand. You can hear, but you don't listen, maybe is a better way of putting it. You listen to the sermon, but you know what? I made it through this week, and I don't really have to do anything with it. Three, you are becoming blind to my work in the world. Blind. You are seeing, you are seeing but not perceiving. Or you are, you, you, you can see things, you're noticing things, or you're not noticing things. You're just sort of going through life with some sort of vision, but you're not taking time to pay attention. You become blind to my work in the world. And because of their loss of passion, because of their deafness, because of their blindness, they have become ineffective leaders and ineffective channels of God's grace. They are not being the effective arms and legs and body of Jesus Christ in the world as they were empowered to be in the Pentecost. Of course, the Jewish leaders are a little different place, but he's also talking to the church here. So Paul is saying, Ye vaita beta, you know better. You know better. And that's what Paul says is going to change things. You know better than to wallow in lost passion, in deafness, and in blindness. In fact, you will have passion. You will see. You will hear if you but turn. Repent. Repent and do what is right. And then you will be healed and you will find fulfillment and transformation in God. And Paul is using the original words of Isaiah who also called his people to repent, to turn, to make a U-turn. So what does that mean? Well, here's the kicker. Isaiah's words through Paul still ring true for us today. It doesn't matter if you're part of Bueller Mennonite Church, whatever you are as a faith person, whether you are at the beginning of your journey, middle of the journey, you've rejected it, whatever, all of us need to hear these words. While Paul is talking to a particular group in his time, he is also calling us to turn and to repent because of dullness of passion, because of spiritual blindness, because deafness are all relevant to us today. All of us are dealing with that in some way in our life right now. Okay, let's say we take Paul up on his offer. Let's say we do turn and repent. Let's say we do take that illegal U-turn on Bueller Main Street and the cop doesn't see us. Then what? How will we more fully experience God's love and peace? How will we feel and know that ex uh, passion? What will it look like? How do we do this? How do we begin to do this, maybe? Well, let's take Paul's offer. Let's take Paul up on his offer in turning, repenting, and then receiving God's grace. And it really takes two sort of actions in our life. One, letting go. And second, picking up. Letting go and picking up. But maybe not picking up the thing that you just let go. You let go and you pick up. What do I mean? In order to faithfully repent, we need to let go. There are certain things in our lives, in our personal and corporate lives as a church as well, as a body, that keep us from coming into and remaining in full relationship with God. That's the key of why we do the thing. You, I know you've heard me say this before. We do the things we do because we're trying to get, or we're, we're, we're inviting each other, we're inviting others into a deeper relationship with God. And if our committee work and all our missions and all that stuff keeps us from that, then we're doing something wrong. Then it's, it's worthless. That's where passion comes in. Then we maybe need to let go of some things. Right? Now you're all wondering, what are the lists? What are the lists? I don't have a list. You need to discern that. 
You need to discern that as, as we talked about last week, how the Holy Spirit walks through us and inspires us when we read Scripture, when we have devotional time, when we have quiet time. That's your work. You need to know that and bring it to the body. These things are what I call habits of division. They might even be done in the name of Jesus, but they don't really bring up the passion of Christ. They don't really allow the Holy Spirit to come through and empower and, and build up the, uh, the people around us. Habits of division keep us from being fully reconciled in many different relationships we have. They cause division and pain and estrangement. And those are the things that we need to examine and let go of, take care of in our lives. Story is told of a little boy who was very upset because he got his hand stuck in a very expensive and rare vase. It was a very important vase. I don't know who was more upset, the, the boy or the parents. The first thing they asked wasn't whether your hand's okay. They wanted to know if the vase was okay. So his hand was stuck in the, and he tried his best, and he just couldn't get it out. So his upset parents tried everything they could. They tried soap, they tried cooking oil, they tried Vaseline, all of it without success. Finally, they couldn't think of anything else to do, and they had to do something because this poor boy couldn't very well go on in life with a vase stuck on his hand, no matter how valuable it was. Plus, the vase loses value when there's a boy stuck in it. So, uh, <laughs> got to do something. So they decided the only way to get the boy's hand out was to break this valuable and rare vase, so they got a hammer. And right before they were going to smash the vase, the frightened little boy cried out, Would it help if I let go of the penny I'm holding on to? <laughs> so it is with us in our lives. All too often. We cause ourselves, we cause others, we cause God great anguish. And we risk something really valuable with the relationships we have because we are not letting go of the insignificant things in life. What might be those things in our lives? Might it be the amount of time we're trying to, we spend trying to make more money to buy more stuff so we can be happy? Might it be how busy we make ourselves? Might it be the self-serving grudges we hold against a neighbor or a church member or a family member? Might it be our need to avenge or to revenge a wrong done to us that consumes us to the point that we no longer recognize God's love for us and people no longer recognize our actions as God's love within us, those fruits of the Spirit we talked about in Colossians? Might it be a petty difference we have about how another person acts or looks or even exists? Might it be stupid and idle gossip and rumors that we tell each other? Might it be the fear with which we live our lives? Every one of us, including me. Now, th th this list, I, I'm not thinking about anyone else here. I'm thinking about myself. But I know that I'm not that much weirder than you. All of us have something that is keeping our hands stuck in the vase and from fully, fully living out life. So let's make it a habit of examining ourselves. In Wednesday night when we did prayer, we talked about the prayer of examine. At the end of every day, to examine yourself. Where has God been present? Where have I hindered God's presence? Where can I more fully practice God's presence? What are the things I need to admit? And notice, we're examining ourselves, not the person beside you or someone else. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you automatically thought, well, right, but if that guy would just. That's not what we're talking about. You can't just control that guy just. But you can control you and yourself in the presence of God. Make it a habit of examining yourself and turning to what you know is right by letting go of the things in the vase. So, we need to let go of things. And after we let go of things, we need to pick up. Now, we don't just pick up anything. It might be a vacuum, but we don't just pick up anything. We are pretty particular about what we pick up. We are invited to pick up a faith that believes God's love and God's forgiveness is real 
And that when Jesus said, therefore, go and do likewise, he meant it, and he meant it for us. God's forgiveness and love needs not only be something we think about, but it's something that emanates, something that radiates into all parts of our lives and into the lives around us. That's passion. That's the gospel that people will bask in. They won't care so much about the words you have to say about how you love. They want to know, is that really who you are? Is God real through you by the way you exhibit what we read about in Colossians? It's kind of like this. You've noticed the two items up on the screen now, and you wondered, when is this long-winded pastor ever going to get to that? And Larry, that's a Ford, by the way. <laughs> See it? <laughs> I could have chose others, but I chose a Ford. So we're staying biblical here. <laughs> Two items on the screen, a steering wheel and a spare tire. Steering wheels, think about it, are absolutely important. A car can't really operate without a steering wheel, although they're trying all these you know, driverless cars. Even they have a steering mechanism, though, right? My grandpa told a story about in CPS in California how they were working up in the mountains in the logging ro roads, and they, every time a logging truck came down the mountain with a full load, they had to get out of the way because those guys weren't going to stop. They happened to see a truck come by that way, and they were like, wow, this guy's out of control. He got to the bottom, and he saw a guy sitting there in the truck, and his steering wheel was in his hand, not attached to the steering stem as he came down the mountain. He was fortunate. But all of us know how important it is that that steering wheel is attached to the stem so you can steer, right? You know what the feeling would be like if you were driving 75 miles an hour and all of a sudden the steering wheel is loose in your hands. Not a good thing. So steering wheels are pretty essential. Now, a spare tire, yeah, it's helpful when you need one or when you want one, but it's not essential like a steering wheel, right? You can still drive the car for the most part, although you take a risk that if you have a flat tire and you don't have a spare, you're going to have a, you know, some, some problems. And it's nice to have just in case you need it, but it's not like the steering wheel. Corey Ten Boom has actually been quoted as the one who talks about, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? And I'm going to apply this even further. Is your faith your steering wheel or your spare tire. The temptation is to make faith our spare tire. Especially when I don't let things go properly, like the boy with his hand in the vase, my faith becomes like a spare tire. But it becomes constant work, constant turning, constant repenting, so that my whole faith becomes the steering wheel of my being and my relationship with God. And when we use faith as a steering wheel, we truly and we fully begin to experience God's grace. Faith is not just something then that's there in case we might just need it. And most of the time, 90% of the time, we don't need it. But it's great to have in the trunk. It becomes that thing that needs to be attached to the way and the direction that our whole being is going. Jesus' first words after his baptism in the Gospel of Mark, Mark 1.15, are repent. Now we know what repent means. Repent and believe in the good news or in the Gospel. You cannot repent. You cannot make that U-turn unless your faith is your steering wheel. A spare tire is not going to help you make that turn. So today I invite you all to turn, repent, receive God's grace. Start working on making your faith, your life, not just the words you say, not just the things you do on a Sunday, but your whole life, the steering wheel and not just the spare tire. That's going to take work, though, for a lot of us, me included, still does. It's a spiritual discipline. And as a way of diligently doing this, I invite all of you to actually practice this on a week. I don't want you just to go home and say, well, you know, the pastor gave us this assignment. Do it. 
I mean, you hire me. You pay me money to talk up here. Now, just allow me to give you an assignment that you might just do, okay? Because it's good for you. Practice this habit of praying daily this week. Just start this week. If you're worried about it taking up too much time in your life, just do it this week. Ask God to make you aware of how you are blind to God's purposes, how you are deaf to God's voice. Take time this week to admit to God in prayer where things haven't happened like they should. Then ask God to forgive you, to fill you with passion, with the Holy Spirit. And you will experience, spurred on by the truth of God, you will begin to experience God's full love in your life. We are loved into repentance, not scared. We repent because we now know better. We know the better way of God's love and God's grace put into action, and we continually draw from that well. And so we're invited to confess our habits of division to God, and God has promised to forgive us. And in order for us to kick off this habit that I've just challenged you to do for this week, and, and if you haven't noticed, I'm hoping that's a hook that you do for the rest of your life, right? You got that, right? I didn't really just mean one week. I meant for the rest of your life. But if it takes one week, just dedicate yourself to it. To kick off this habit to, to, of, of confessing and repenting, let's begin right now. Let's begin right now in a time of confession. And if you notice, I often allow for that in church, like a time of silence, because I figure that at least one time in the week, uh, and I, I find this too, that, that it's just good for someone to help me spot me in that. Let's use the question that's on your sermon guides or up on the screen right there as our confessional to lead you before God. We're going to have a moment of silence. And I want you to ponder on this question. I want you to pray. You're talking to God. And you don't have to worry about being in a line. God, as I understand it, hears us all at the same time. Speak to God. How have I been blind or ignored God's purposes. And when he points those out, confess them, give them to God, and then make the U-turn. I'll end with spoken prayer, and then we're going to end with a spoken song, or a, a sung song, a prayer. Let's come before God.
Lord, our lives are cluttered by too many things and too much to do. And we are driven by the need to succeed and distracted by our service. And we've often lost our way. We see a lot, we hear a lot, but sometimes the listening and understanding and uh, really soaking it in comes hard for us. Forgive us. Lord, continue to convict us with your Holy Spirit. Just absolutely convict us in our hearts of where it is we need to slow our car down, take the steering wheel that you have provided for us, and make that U-turn. And then, Lord, help us, ensure us abs to absolutely know your truth, that you said that if we but confess our sins, you will be quick and faithful to forgive them, that as far as the east is from the west, you will drive them from us, that indeed you will clean us and make us whole, whiter than snow. Lord, help us now to open our eyes, our ears, and everything to your work, and then empower us to join that work. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. to help me read the words of 1 Peter. And in doing so, if you would turn in your hymnal worship books, actually it's up there as well in this case, um, I will read the regular print, you will read the bold. These words from 1 Peter are a reminder of who we are. And really, that's what Memorial Day is, a reminder, lest we forget. Every time the, the people of Israel people of the Bible got into trouble is when they forgot. And we raise stones as memory, memorial stones, tombstones. Many of us will visit those stones of memory. Listen to how Peter puts this imagery of stones and memory of who we are. First Peter chapter 2, I the regular print, you the bold. Come to him a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourself be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Once you were not a people. Once you had not received mercy. I wonder, Keith, if you could go back to the one, the part where I read, once you were not a people. I want us to change that, lest we think we're talking about someone else. Let's put it in we language. Once we were not a people. Once we had not received mercy. Let's stand for a blessing.
Then may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace as a people of God, driven by the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.